Hi, Faith Bible Church family. It's interesting to see you in this format, but we are excited that you have joined us nonetheless. I realize that these are different, confusing, and odd days for us, especially as a church, not being able to gather. But we do hope that the next few moments of God's Word will be an encouragement to you, even though we can't be together today. As I've been processing everything that's been going on the last week, I'm reminded of a text that we read a few weeks ago from Psalm 95. And I just want to read for you the first six verses, but listen to its relevance, especially in light of what we're dealing with even today. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust, for he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and a buckler. You will not fear the terror of the day, nor the arrow that flies by night, nor the pestilence that stalks in darkness, nor the destruction that wastes at noonday. Isn't it interesting that even in that time, God's people still faced similar fears? And yet he was still their trust and their refuge. And so to strengthen your trust and your faith, we will be sharing with you from God's word today. As originally planned, Rob Clark will be preaching for us today. I first heard him preach this message a few months ago at a conference we were serving at together in Missouri. And I just knew when I heard it that it would be so applicable for our own body, our own church and I think you'll find it immensely encouraging. Uh, so listen carefully as God's word is preached for us in a few moments. And we look forward to being able to serve you more in the days ahead. Hopefully not many more times through this format, but in whatever way that we can, don't hesitate to reach out. And we look forward to seeing what God will do through his word today. Amen. So I just wanted to give you a, a little behind the scenes of what's been going on today. So Pastor Justin is traveling with his family and he's traveling back from the mountains. And so the video you just saw, uh, they recorded, he recorded in the hotel this evening. And the video you're about to see of Rob preaching, we recorded this afternoon at church, uh, several of us there, um, just so that he was able to interact with people. Uh, as traditionally, as you know, uh, we do we do read a passage of scripture that aligns with the text that's going to be preached upon. And so today we're going to continue that tradition uh, by me reading from Luke chapter 9, verses 23 through 27. So feel free to look that up in your own Bibles, read along, or just be blessed by hearing God's word. So this is Luke chapter 9, verses 23 through 27. And he, Jesus, said to all, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in his glory, in the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. But I tell you truly, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. We love you. We appreciate you during this difficult time and look forward to serving you and um, look forward to hearing the preaching of God's word now clock is set for 45 minutes. I will do my best to do it in 45 minutes. That is not my automatic clock inside of my head. So you know what, if you speak, you know what kind of challenge that is. You could pray about that. The other thing I want to say just before we get started is, number one, thank you guys for coming out here. I could not do this. Seriously, I could not do this if you weren't here. I've tried to do stuff in front of a camera. I can't explain it. I cannot do it. I have to see faces. I have to see you go, what? So that I know what to say next. And so 
But last night when I got, I don't know if I think it was Mark's message that this was going to happen, and then Phil wrote to me and said, hey, do you mind coming to the church and, and doing your message? I, I just wrote back, yep, sent it and didn't pay attention to it. And then I thought, did I? I looked back and he said, Saturday. <laughs> so I wrote back and I said, Phil, Saturday's tomorrow. Is that what you mean? Call me. <laughs> so he called me. He says, yeah, yeah, yeah. We want to do it Saturday so we have time to work with it. You're ready, right? I said, well, yeah, not mentally, but yeah, yeah, yeah. But I thought last night if I was the pastor of this church, I would want to preach on something other than I'm preaching on. Like I'd want to go to Habakkuk or I'd want to go somewhere like that and address the congregation who is in shock that we just canceled service and in shock that they just heard about a natural uh, nationwide emergency, et cetera, et cetera. There are more appropriate places to go. But on the other hand, God is sovereign, right? And this is what I have been preparing for. And so this is what, Lord willing, as you pray, and uh, God's Holy Spirit, it's his word. So hopefully it'll be something that will be exactly what people need to hear. Uh, but it's not what I would have uh, chosen had I had time to think about it. If you want to uh, open your Bible so that we're together, you could go to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Our scripture reading today was from Luke chapter 9, verses 23 and following, about taking up your cross and following Christ. And our passage that we're going to be settling in on this morning is from 1 Corinthians 9, verses 19 through 23. Before I read that, let's pray, and then we'll begin. Father, thank you for the opportunity to be together with your people today, to open up your word, and to know with great confidence that your word is quick and powerful, and that it is able to get into the innermost parts of our lives. And Lord, expose our sin, encourage our godliness, basically accomplish your perfect will in our lives. So we pray that your word would do that for us today, and we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. I think you would all agree with Isaiah 55, when the Lord says, For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. Right? You, you all agree with that? We're all, yes, God's ways are so much higher than my ways. And I also agree. But I still like my ways. I don't know about you, but I, I find myself day to day liking my ways maybe more than I ought to. I, I like my friends. I, I like to hang around with the people that I like to hang around with. I like to be with people that I can communicate with and feel comfortable around. I like my hometown in New England, not Florida, in New England, in Rhode Island specifically, in Charlestown, Rhode Island, very specifically. That's my hometown. And personally, I think it's better than your hometown. Okay? That's, that's just... I, I like my ways. I like my traditions. I like the things that I've experienced in my life. I like my language. I like speaking English. You can go almost anywhere in the world, except for China, and speak English and just go at it. And I, and I love that. And I wish I spoke English a little bit better than I do. But I like my own language. I like my own food don't necessarily like your food. I like my own clothes, which is not what I have on today, although I've gotten accustomed to wearing this. My clothes are jeans and a flannel shirt, and I feel most comfortable when I'm in jeans and a flannel shirt. I just like my ways. I guess in short, I could say I've developed a comfort zone, and I'm quite comfortable in my zone. And I think it's probably true about you. I think every one of us has, over time, built around us a comfort zone. And we're comfortable there, and we are uncomfortable when we're pressed outside of there. I think our scripture today addresses this issue, and I'm pretty sure it's going to be a challenge to every one of us as we think it through. So look back at your Bibles again, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, and we'll read through the verses beginning with verse 19, 
The Apostle Paul says, For though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win more of them. To the Jews I became as a Jew in order to win Jews. To those under the law I became as one under the law, though not being myself under the law, that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law I became as one outside the law, not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those outside the law. To the weak I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, that by all means I might save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel, that I may share with them in its blessing. I don't know what what you hear when you hear that read, but my initial response is, wow, like that sounds hard. (laughs) That that sounds hard to me, to, to adapt who I am to be able to communicate to people who are not like me. I don't like to do that. I already told you, I like my own friends. I I like people who understand me. I like people who are easy to talk to. And yet this seems so much more complicated than that. And then I wonder, well, maybe this is just for people like Paul. (laughs) Maybe this is something that the apostles had to do. Or or maybe, as some have said, this is for people gospel ministers and, and missionaries. You know, you know those people that go to the other side of the world and learn a new language and learn a new custom and a whole new lifestyle. I mean, it's like night and day of what they're used to doing, way, way, way outside their comfort zone. And so maybe Paul's talking about people like himself who are in special places of ministry and, and they need to make these kind of sacrifices. And so it brings to my mind, then, so what about us? Then why do, why do we read this passage of Scripture in church? Has this anything to do with the average member here at Faith Bible Church? Does this speak to you and I this morning as we look at it? Does it have any bearing on our lives? And I think to get the answer to that, like we just helicoptered and parachuted into a passage of Scripture of which we haven't studied what came before or looked at what came afterwards. That's the difficulty with a message like this. So I'm not going to take a lot of time and preach seven other messages to get us up to this place in 1 Corinthians, but I do think if we take a look at the context, the context will teach us, does this have to do with me or is this something Paul and the other apostles and ministers of the gospel need to struggle with? And if it does have something to do with me, God, wake me up. Help me hear. Help me listen. So let's look back. The context really starts back in chapter 8. I'd love to read all of 8, all of 9, and all of 10, which is the context for this passage. But obviously, we don't have time to do that. So if you would allow me to highlight some verses in chapter 8, 9, and 10, to give us the big picture of what Paul's talking about so that when we go back to this little nugget of truth in verses 19 through 23, we can see who this applies to. Who's he talking to? What's the purpose? What's the point? So let's go back to chapter 8. We'll begin right with verse 1. And I'm going to kind of bounce from place to place, so try to follow with me. Verse 1. Now concerning foods offered to idols. Okay, let's let's just stop there and be honest for a minute. For the average Christian in America who reads, now concerning food offered to idols, there's something that happens from here on. Click. I'm off. It's like I don't even have a clue what he's talking about. And it's certainly, I can't remember the last time this has been a big struggle in my life to deal with foods and idols and so forth. But I want you to keep listening because it's a much bigger topic than food or idols. Listen as it continues. Paul says, For we know that all of us possess knowledge. This knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. If anyone imagines that he knows something, he does not yet know as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, he is known by God. Do you see any kind of contrast going on here? Paul, the big topic that's being introduced here has a whole lot to do with knowledge and love. Now, we know those two things go together as believers, don't we? We know that we're to speak knowledge. We're to speak the truth. How? In love. 
right? They, they, they are married together. If all you have is knowledge, you got problems. If all you have is love, you got problems. So they go together. But I think what we're going to see is knowledge is limited. Our, even our knowledge of God is limited, right? We see in a glass dimly, Paul says, not too long after this. There's a lot that we don't know about God. There's a lot we don't know about our future. There's a lot we don't know. So he's contrasting, in a sense, those who think they know it all and the higher priority of love. Look at it again. Now, all of us possess knowledge. It's at different levels, obviously, but we all possess knowledge. And you know what knowledge does? It often puffs up, doesn't it? But here's the contrast. Love does the very opposite. Love builds up. Love, it thinks about the good of others. And then listen to verse 2. Let me, let me paraphrase verse 2. Have you ever met a know-it-all? <laughs> like everybody's smiling. Have we not all met a know-it-all? Whether it's in spiritual things or chemistry or whatever, you've met a know-it-all. And what Paul says is, if anyone's a know-it-all, he thinks he knows it all, he does not yet know as he ought to know. Because if he knew as he ought to know, he would not be a know-it-all. He would be a lover of God and a lover of people. So this is the bigger topic that Paul's going to deal with through. And I'm just going to read quickly on this topic of food offers to idols, because this is the issue that came up in Corinth, verse 4. Therefore, based upon this truth, as to eating foods offered to idols or, or whatever other liberty issue may come into your life as a Christian, we could say that, we know that an idol has no real existence and that there's only one God. Drop down to 7. However, not all possess this knowledge. Hmm. Verse 9, but take care that this freedom of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. Not every Christian has the same level of understanding in Scripture. I don't think that's very hard to understand, is it? Some people have been saved for a month. Some people have been saved for 40 years. They have different levels of understanding of who God is and what the Scripture means, etc., etc. And they're all mixed in here in our church. And so there's going to be people understanding all sorts of different things. And so knowledge cannot be the test of fellowship, the test of godliness. It's how do we treat people who don't have the same understanding as we do? How do we treat people that have a much greater understanding than we do? Well, you just take care of this freedom, this right of yours. In this case, to eat food that was offered to idols, no big deal. There are no such thing as idols so that you don't become a stumbling block to the weak. Drop down to verse 13. Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, the Apostle Paul said, I'll never eat meat. There's my, there's my resolution, Paul said. If, if this issue is going to be a stumbling block to a brother in Christ, I'm just not going to do it when I'm with that brother in Christ, for sure. Lest I make my brother stumble. So we enter verse, uh, uh, chapter 9, verse 1, and Paul basically brings up two ideas that he's going to deal with in chapter 9 and 10. Am I free? Question mark. Am I not an apostle? Question mark. Those two questions are going to be answered. Um, the second question is answered first. Am I not an apostle? He begins to answer that and prove that very obviously he is an apostle. And he has the rights and freedoms of a servant of Christ as an apostle. That's what the beginning part of chapter 9 um, develops. Let me just read you, read you one or two of those verses so that you hear it. Verse 4, do, do we not have the right to eat and drink? Do we not have the right to take along a believing wife as do the other apostles and brothers of the Lord and Cephas? Drop down to uh, verse 11. If, if we have sown spiritual things among you, is it too much for us to re reap material things from you? If others share in this freedom, in this rightful claim on your life, do not we as apostles even more? Then listen to the next part of that verse. Nevertheless, we have not made use of this freedom. We have not made use of this right. The reason I'm using freedom and right, your translation may say freedom and may say right. It's the same Greek term translated throughout this. Sometimes right, sometimes freedom. That's why I'm doing that. 
We have not made use of this freedom, but we endure anything rather than put an obstacle in the way of the gospel of Christ. Verse 15, but I have made no use of any of these rights. And on and on to verse 19, where we pick up our context, for am I not free? Now we're beginning. He's already proved he's an apostle. He's already defended his apostleship. And now he's going to talk about this freedom he has as a new creature in Christ. Now I want to go to the following context. Because the following context will answer whether this has anything to do with you or just apostles. Okay? So let's jump ahead to chapter 10, verse 23. Paul's continuing to battle with the same things. He's saying, listen. Verse 23, all things are lawful, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful, but not all things give knowledge. No, that's not his concern. Not all things build up. Not all things promote love. That's the issue we're dealing with. Verse 24, let no one seek his own good, selfishness, but the good of his neighbor, love. Okay, the issue is very clear. We get to the end of chapter 10, and Paul summarizes really the text that we're going to look at this morning when he says this in verse 31. So, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do. Okay, do you hear that? Fill in the blank of the freedoms that you have as a new creature in Christ to do whatever. To have whatever kind of whatever in your church, in your life, etc., etc., that whatever you do, you do it all to the glory of God. And basically he's saying, remember this. This is what he's been talking about. This is what we will specifically talk about. Remember this. Give no offense to Jews, to Gentiles, Greeks, or to the church of God. Just as I try to please everyone in everything I do, not seeking my own advantage, but that of many that they may be saved. Can you hear the same theme from beginning to end? I will stop doing whatever I have to stop doing for the good of others, for the ultimate purpose that they would be delivered to be saved. Now, for some, that means salvation, like eternal salvation to the Jew and to the Greek. To the church of God, it means sanctification, ongoing deliverance from the Lord in our life, from our sin and our growth in Jesus Christ. So both of those things are being dealt with, and I think it's important that we see that. And so if this is the living Word of God, and if Paul is talking to all of us in whatever we do, which is who he's talking to. He's talking to the whole church at Corinth. In whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God, and just make sure you're not offensive the gospel is offensive, but don't you be offensive to Jews, Greeks, or even the church of God. So what sort of, outside of your comfort zone, what sort of sacrifice are you willing to make as a believer? What cost are you willing to pay so that others can come to know Jesus Christ and experience the blessings of eternal life that you have in your life. To see others grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus. What sacrifices are you willing to make? I think our text today speaks about a sacrifice of an ordinary, everyday type. Like, I think as Americans, when we think of sacrifice, we think of somebody going into the military, specifically going into special forces, to the elite of the elitist, jumping out of a plane in the dark in enemy territory, and going in and risking life and limb to take out the enemy. I, I, I think that's what we think of when we hear sacrifice. But this passage of Scripture we're looking at is calling for sacrifice of an ordinary everyday type. And listen, all sacrifice is costly. All sacrifice costs you something. If Paul decides not to eat meat so that he doesn't offend a brother, that cost him something. It's a comfort that he gave away for the sake of somebody else. Every sacrifice costs something. So I want you to be thinking this this morning as we turn to our passage. 
How can I use my freedoms in Christ, which we all have, to serve? Because that's what we're going to be talking about. How can I use my freedoms in Christ to serve so that through my life, as Paul puts it, that if by any means I might save some? That by if any means I might deliver a brother from his sin, save a sinner from eternal death. Paul said in another place, don't use your freedom as an opportunity for your flesh, but through love serve one another. That's what, that's what Paul's talking about here. So keep that in your mind. How can I personally use my freedom in Christ to serve? And I think this text calls us in a specific way for the sake of, of the gospel. And here's how we're to do it. It's the way of self-denial. Now, that's an American term, huh? That, that's, we hear it on all the TV shows. You know, you need to learn to deny yourself. Yeah, right. Our whole culture is opposite that. Our whole culture is filled with how-to books to build yourself and your benefits and you name it. And yet this passage is saying, here, the way of sacrifice is the way of self-denial. You think about it, after Paul's amazing conversion on the road to Damascus, he still had to get up in the morning and choose every single day to deny himself for the sake of the gospel. Oh yeah, he was radically transformed. He saw Jesus. None of you probably saw Jesus quite the way Paul saw Jesus. So we think, wow, radical transformation. He was blinded. Unbelievable. But guess what? He still went to sleep, and he still woke up the next day. Yeah, a new creature in Christ, but, and, a, and a man who had the Holy Spirit, but he was still a man who had to make decisions about what he was going to do that day with the life that God just rescued. And day after day after day, the Apostle Paul made self-denial choices. And those choices created in his life a life-dominating conviction. That's point one for you. A life-dominating conviction. This did not happen just because he was saved and rescued. Now, that gave him the ability to have this. But it was the daily denying of self that developed in his heart and life a life-dominating conviction, and we see that in verse 19. It's to serve others. Listen, this is not who Paul was before he met Christ. He was not about serving others. He was about serving himself, progressing in his path of becoming the best of the best, the top dog of the top dogs of the Pharisees, the teacher of all teachers, except for his uh, teacher Gamaliel himself. It was all about Paul. And it was all about the way he was doing his religion. And anybody that got in the way of what he was doing suffered greatly, did they not? It wasn't just Christians, but certainly we know the Christians did to death, to prison and to death, who got in his way. And then he meets Jesus. And everything changes. And you think the day after he woke up, he had no memory of what he had been doing with his life? No temptation to think that these Christians are deceiving him? No, you think all that disappeared? Did all of your past disappear when you trusted Christ? I don't think so. That's what we battle, is it not? So he had to make decisions. And Paul's saying to us in verse 19, For though I am free, I have freedom in Christ, I am a new creature, cre creation, I'm free from everybody. Nobody is master over me except Jesus Christ. I am completely free to live my life, to glorify God, whether you like what I'm doing or not. That's what Paul's saying. But listen to the next phrase. But I have made myself a servant to all. I have made myself. This did not come naturally. And Paul's not saying, giving us some hypothetical theory. You know, we should all try to become more servant-like. You know, Jesus was a servant. We should try to be a servant like Jesus. He's saying to these specific believers in Corinth, you know, 
You know I'm an apostle. He just, he just reminded them of how much they knew that. They, they were evidence that he was an apostle of Christ. And then he said, you know I'm free. Free and able to do anything I want. And you know I made myself a servant to every one of you. He's an apostle of Christ. And he put himself at the bottom of the pyramid in Corinth as a servant to every one of them. And he tells us why. That I might win more of them. He had this conviction that he was to be a servant to all. He says later on to this same church, listen to this verse. It's 2 Corinthians 4, 5, but let me just read it. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, this is not what we're preaching, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. Can I, can I say that again? What we proclaim is not our idea, it's not our message. Here's the message we proclaim. Jesus is Lord. That's the message. The message doesn't ever change. You know, a lot of times when people are dealing with this passage, they're dealing with all the wrong things. They're trying to defend their music in their church or their, the, what they wear when they go to church. And they're trying to defend all these things they do. I, blah, 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 blah. That's not what's going on here. The message doesn't change. Jesus is Lord. Is he your Lord? <laughs> Truly? Is he the master that determines what you did today? What you're going to do tomorrow? Paul said, that's the message we bring. And ourselves, what, what part do we play? Listen, ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. That's my role. That's your role as a Christian. To take the message that doesn't change. We don't adapt the message to the audience, folks. The message that doesn't change is Jesus Christ is Lord. But ourselves... We step out of our comfort zones and we step into your zone with this message of power that we might win the more. Do you see what Paul's saying? So what did it look like in his life? Well, he set aside his liberties, right? Isn't that basically what we just read? He set aside things that he had the right to do for the sake of others. He said, although I'm free, I set that aside and make myself in bondage, the opposite of freedom, as your servants for Jesus' sake. Time and time again, he does that. We have lots of scripture that we could look at. We won't look at them all. Let me just highlight a couple you can do at home. And you might have lots of time to do this soon. So you might want to write these down and look at these at home. But there's an example from Acts chapter 15, verses 19 through 21. After the Jerusalem council uh, the apostles are getting ready to take this uh, message out to the churches so that Paul can take this message out, that they don't have to be circumcised, this, that, and the other. And they list some things in there that, as believers today, we look at and go, mm, wait a minute, why did they say that? You know, that they can't eat something strangled by, it's like, is that part of the gospel? And it wasn't part of the gospel. As a matter of fact, in verse 21, Paul answers why that was part of that. Because Moses has traditionally been preached through all of these places we're going. So these people have this in their background. Everywhere Paul went, where did he go first? To the synagogue. And so let's not offend all the Jews just for the sake of offending them. Hey, I got the freedom to eat pork. I'm going to eat it. I don't care whether they like it or not. And we let some of these things go so that we can get into that audience and preach Jesus Christ is Lord. And again, Timothy had Timothy circumcised. A lot of Christians look at that and go, okay, wait a minute. I just thought we said that they don't circumcise these guys because of the pressure of the gospel. He didn't do it for the pressure of the gospel. He did it because Timothy's dad was a Greek and he wanted to be able to take Timothy into Jewish settings. For the gospel's sake. Had nothing to do with salvation. Had nothing to do with teaching others that they needed to be uh, circumcised. Had to do with reaching the Jews. Winning the Jews. And then I think one of the most powerful. That was Acts 16. One of the most powerful is 2 Corinthians 11.24. I'll read it to you. 
Five times I received at the hand of the Jews 40 lashes, lest one. Why is that so significant? Five times they beat me to a pulp, whipped my back, ripped me up with 39 lashes. The Jews did. <laughs> Paul accepted these penalties on his own life for the very purpose of staying in the Jewish community for the sake of the gospel. Paul was a Roman citizen. Paul could have gotten out of every one of these penalties if he wanted to. And had he, he would have been all right. He was free to do that. He was a Roman citizen. He used that sometimes for different purposes. Never for himself. You remember in Philippi when he used that Roman citizenship gig? What was that for? It was so that when he left town, the Christians didn't pay for what had happened to him. He didn't look like a criminal because he was a Christian, leaving all the Christians behind as criminals. It was very clear he was not, that the authorities were wrong, which left the Christians in freedom when he left. He could have done that for these five times. They beat his back to a pulp. Why didn't he? Because he wanted to be able to go to the next town and walk into the synagogue and be received by the Jews, who would then say to him, Brother, bring us a word from God. Gladly. And he'd preach Jesus Christ as Lord. Now that's out of my comfort zone. I don't know about you. Do you see the extent the Apostle Paul went out of his way to lay aside what he could rightfully do for the sake of the gospel? So he put, it, put these things aside he also put himself into slavery. Paul put himself into slavery. How did he do that? Well, sometimes it looked like a parent. I made myself a servant. If you're a parent, you know exactly what I'm going to talk about here. If there's any place that you're a servant, cleaning up dirty messes for somebody beneath you, it's being a parent. And Paul uses this in 1 Thessalonians with the believers there where he went to disciple that particular nation, so to speak, with the gospel. And what did he say to them? Right? They received the gospel. Unbelievable things happened in that city. And as he's writing to them, he says, you remember, I became like a nursing mother when I was among you. Do, do any of you men here struggle at all trying to figure out the Apostle Paul being a nursing mom? I, I mean, I, I think so. But he didn't struggle with saying that about himself. Because like a parent, listen to what he said when he wrote to these same people right here in Corinth. I will not be a burden, for I seek not what is yours, but you. Does not every parent do the same? I seek not what is yours, but I seek you. For children aren't obligated to save up for their parents, but parents for their children. I will most gladly spend and be spent for your souls. Does not every parent do that? Like a nursing mother, like an instructional father, setting down the guidelines and the barriers and providing the discipline needed for the sake of the children, not for himself. So I wonder this morning, are you willing to give up what you want for your son or for your daughter so that the Lord can use you to give to your children what he wants for them? Think about that. We all have high hopes for our children. Every parent wants their kids to be what they weren't. It's a dangerous mindset. Are we willing to give that up so that God can do in our children's lives what God wants to do in our children's lives? So sometimes putting yourself into slavery looks like a parent. This one's going to rock your boat a little bit. Sometimes it looks like being a priest. Okay, wait a minute. I thought we were in a Bible church here. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Where's this guy going? Try not to think of the priest that you just thought of and try to think of the Old Testament. Okay, let's stay in the Bible and think about this from Paul's perspective because Paul was not ashamed to 
used priestly language when he talked about his ministry. 1 Corinthians 9, 13, we didn't read it, but he uses priestly language. Romans 15, 16, he says, I am a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles in the priestly service of the gospel of God. What on earth? So Paul, ah, the apostle Paul was the first priest. <laughs> no, 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 no. Priestly ministry. What do you think of when you think of a priestly ministry? You think of someone bringing people before God, right? Don't you? You think of someone bringing people before God. And maybe you even think of someone bringing God to people. Well, think about the gospel. When Paul walks into Corinth, does he not bring God to the people? This idol-filled place, demonic to the ultimate. The Apostle Paul brings God to them like a priest brings people, brings God to people. And then 1 Thessalonians, when he's talking about that discipleship relationship where he was a mom, he was a dad, he was working hard among them that they might grow and be strengthened in their faith. He is bringing the people before God. When you bring someone, when you bring the word of God, when you're discipling somebody and you're in their life, you are growing them, drawing them closer and closer to God. Our responsibility as Christians is very priestly. Let me remind you, Peter said, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood. We don't think about that too much as believers. We, as believers in Christ, are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possessions, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Listen, Paul wasn't this way naturally. He made himself through a myriad of small choices. He made himself a servant to all. There is no abracadabra here. He's, he meets Jesus on the road to Damascus, and all of a sudden he's a servant to all. Wouldn't that be nice? Wouldn't that be nice? No, every day he woke up, some days grumpier than others. And had to make personal decisions to serve others and to love others. And Paul did it. And so that created in him this life-dominating conviction to be a servant. And it also created a life-altering aim to win others. Uh, you can't look at Paul's life before Christ and think he had others in mind at all except in a negative way. You look at his ministry the rest of his life to his death and all he's thinking about and all he's talking about are other people and their need for Christ or their need for growth. He had a life-altering aim to win others. You hear it over and over again. Look at that I might win the more at the end of verse 19. Verse 20, to the Jews I became a Jew in order that I might win the Jews. Those under the law as under the law, not myself under the law, but that I might win those under the law. Outside the law, not outside the law, but being under the law of Christ, that I might win those outside the law. To the weak, weak, that I might win the weak. I've become all things to all people, that by all means, I might save some. His aim in life had completely changed. And this is the aim that, w that took over his life all the way to death. Why? Because he was an apostle? Or because he was a Christian? I think that's the question you and I have to answer this morning. And I think you know the answer. It's because he was a Christian, a follower of Christ, that the aim of his life didn't change overnight because he got saved, but because he died daily to himself to follow Jesus Christ, to win others for Christ, the Jews, the Gentiles, the weak, which I believe are Christians. If you read it in the context of chapter 8, I think he's talking about believers. I think there's both, both evangelism and discipleship in this passage. Not everybody thinks that, but I think it's pretty clear. And I, and I don't think Paul ever really delineates 
between those two things. The Great Commission is both of those. It's make disciples of, of every nation. That, that can't happen without evangelism. That can't happen without discipleship. And so we've got the lost Jews, we've got the lost Gentiles, and we've got weak Christians that don't have the knowledge to this point, and they need to be won and encouraged in their walk with God and strengthened in that. And Paul was concerned about all of those things because in chapter 8 he says, so by your knowledge the weak is destroyed, the very brother for whom Christ died. That's the context. So I think the weak is a reference to brothers and sisters in Christ who need our encouragement. So Paul deliberately identified with those that he was seeking to save. That's a challenge for us, I think, that places us outside of our comfort zone. But I think a more important question is this. Save from what? Like his whole focus in life, his whole aim in life was to win people that, that they might be saved. Save from what? Save from like a bad marriage? Save from a bad job? Save from the COVID-19 virus? Right? Isn't that what a lot of people seem to preach? That Jesus came to rescue you from all of your trouble. He wants to make your life so wonderful and he'll protect you from the virus. Don't worry. And yet the message that doesn't ever change is Jesus Christ is Lord. He is to be bowed before. There is a virus that is very scary. It's very deadly. It's eternally deadly. It's sin. And everybody, man, woman, boy, and girl, is in danger of that virus. So yeah, Christ did come to rescue us from a virus, but it's not COVID-19. It's sin. Listen to these scriptures. Having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. Our sins bring upon us what hangs over every man, woman, boy, and girl is the wrath of God because of their sin. And Jesus Christ, as Lord, laid his life down on the cross to take care of that, for us to bow before him. 1 Thessalonians 1.10 says, Jesus delivers us. Jesus saves us from what? From the wrath to come. He's not a counselor. He's not here to make our lives more comfortable. He's here to rescue us from God's wrath. And that's the message that we take. The message doesn't change. His aim was to win as many as he could. And the results of his aim was to share in that blessing. Listen how he wraps that up. That I, I do it all, verse 23, for the sake of the gospel that I may share with them in its blessing. Paul's desire to win as many as God would allow him to win. And please, you all, at least here at Faith, understand man doesn't save anybody. God saves. But God doesn't save with angels. God doesn't save with a voice from heaven. God saves through you and me. And, it, and if you and I aren't willing to get outside our comfort zone and share the truth that Jesus Christ is Lord, people are not going to get saved. That's the way Paul saw his life. It became his aim that everybody would hear from him that message. It needs to become our aim as well. And then the last thing, this life-dominating conviction and life-altering aim was fueled by a life-changing motivation. I, I don't think we can read these verses together and not sense Paul's love for Jews, Greeks, and even the weakest Christians that exist. Paul was willing to become a servant to every one of them. That's love. That's exactly what he said in chapter 8, verse 1. There's a lot of know-it-alls, but it's the one who loves who builds up. And that's what our freedom has been given to us in Christ to do, is to love others. That's the life-changing motivation, to love others. Let me read to you. 
what he said in, to this same church in the next letter, 2 Corinthians 5.14, very familiar to you, I'm sure. For the love of Christ controls us because we have concluded this. This is what we know, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. Wow, is that not a summary of what we've been talking about from this passage, of the heart of the Apostle Paul? This is what we know. This is the knowledge we have. This is the freedom we have in Christ. What are we doing with it? Are we not calling people to place themselves under the leadership of Jesus Christ, to repent of their sin and trust in Christ and be saved? We have to condescend, and I don't mean that the way you're thinking. We have to humble ourselves. Not compromise. This is not about compromise. This is about humbling ourselves to demonstrate that we love Jews, Greeks, and even the weakest believer. You condescend, you humble yourself to what's optional. You compromise when you give up what's not optional. What's not optional? To love the Lord your God with all your heart and your neighbor as yourself. That's not optional. That's what we're being called to do. Let me just wrap it up with a couple of uh, personal applications. I want to talk to the men here today specifically. Start here. Uh, you're the leaders in your family. You're the leaders in the church. You've been given great responsibility by God in that leadership role for others to imitate you as you imitate Christ. That's the first verse in chapter 11, by the way, which really doesn't go in 11. I should have read it at the end of chapter 10. Do all you do to the glory of God, and he wraps it up, imitate me as I imitate Christ. And so as men, I want to talk about two different areas in our lives as men that, that I want you to think about this idea of self-denial. First of all, on the issue of salvation, let me ask you this. What cost are you willing to pay? Men, what cost are you willing to pay? What personal freedom are you willing to surrender so that your friends and family who don't know Christ may be saved from the wrath of God? Think about that for a second. What, how far outside your comfort zone are you willing to step in order that somebody who lives outside that comfort zone, which is most everybody, has the opportunity to hear you talk about Jesus Christ, the Lord, and that powerful message of salvation. And secondly, on the issue of sanctification, and this is where I think we struggle the most. We think we got this one down, but I think this is our toughest area. What cost are you willing to pay? What personal freedom are you willing to surrender so that your family, your wife, your children, who are in need of your loving service, actually receive it? Well, what do I mean? Let me, let me make it a little more practical. So are you willing to de deny yourself your man cave time? You do know what I'm talking about, right? Got to have my man cave. Got to have my, my place where I can go be a man and where I can be alone and have my mean, me only time. And I treasure that so much in my life that I guard and I protect my schedule so that I can have my me time, my man cave time. I know you don't know anything about what I'm saying. Or do you? Well, Paul said this a little bit later in this same letter. I want you to go home with this man. Remain on guard. Persist in standing firm in the faith. Always act like men. Be made strong. On every occasion, let all that you do be done in love. Wow. 
Wow. Everything that we do be done to build up the good of others, not ourselves. Now visit the man cave again. Is it getting in the way of your time with your children? With your wife? You might want to examine that. Ladies, I don't want to leave you out. Here's a tough question. Are you willing to lay aside your desire to use your husband and or your children to get out of life what you want? Are you willing to stop nagging your husband with your endless honey-do lists? Is there anything wrong with the honey-do list? No, there's nothing wrong with the honey-do list. Here's what's wrong. Nagging your husband with your honey-do list. Let me just give it to you this way. Will you rather submit your life to the Lord and respect the man God has given you and trust that the sovereign Lord who rules the universe can master your husband's heart better than you can? Are you willing to let God be God and you be submitted to him and watch him do in your husband's life what you cannot do? And for all of us, uh, I think specifically now, as our country's going through what it's currently going through with this virus scare and all this top-down restrictions on our country, what are you willing to risk to be a servant to those in crisis? I think that's a good question for every one of us to ask. You know, doctors and nurses don't even have to think about this question. They just go. And they risk their lives and they risk the lives of their families to minister to people who are in crisis. What are we, Faith Bible Church, willing to do to be servants to those who are in crisis? To be servants to our senior saints and others who are in need. Peter said, as each has received a gift and every gift is different, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. If you really want your life to be about the gospel, for the sake of the gospel, which is what we read here this morning, you have to ask yourself what you're willing to pay. What sacrifice, what cost am I really willing to deny myself for the advance of the gospel? Father, thank you for the word of God. Thank you for the patience of your people, for the hunger of your people to listen and desire to hear from you your word for our lives. God, please use it today in our hearts to cause us to be sensitive to your Spirit's work so that Jesus Christ the Lord would be glorified in and through our lives. We thank you for it in his precious name. Amen.